Okay. The reading today is taken from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they may not come they not hence, even of your lusts at war in your members. Ye lust and you have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye not ask, ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Yet adulterers, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Amen. Morning. Question is, what causes fighting? And from the reading we had, it all comes from within ourselves. You may take a look at that picture and it might look vaguely familiar. Then when you look at the name A.Y. Jackson, you'll know, oh yeah, the, the group of seven. But this doesn't look like a typical group of seven painting. Usually we're used to seeing red maples and crimsons, oranges, yellows, lovely skies. A copse in the evening. But you look at this copse of trees and they're all skeletons. Then you take a look at the date, 1916. And you take a look at the terrain and you see all these mounds, mounds of dirt, craters, and you see something that looks like a ladder. It's actually called a duck walk. And this is spread over the mud. And you may not be able to see them because they're not that important to Jackson, but there were actually a couple of human figures there, very small. These are soldiers. These are infantrymen. 1916, actually in 1915, Jackson left his friend, Tom Thompson, back in Canada to continue to paint. And he went over to fight in Flanders. He was injured. Shrapnel in the shoulder, shrapnel in the hip. And that put him out. But Lord Beaverbrook, Lord Beaverbrook Art Collection, came along and he said to Jackson, I want you and other Canadian artists to paint visions of the war so that we can show this to Canadians. What is going on over here? And this is probably Jackson's most famous wartime picture. Very reminiscent of other things that he had done here in Canada, Northern Ontario and British Columbia, but it's haunting. And you see these shafts of light, these beams of light, but they're not coming from the sky down. These are searchlights shoot, shooting up into the sky, searching for enemy planes. So it's a rather gloomy, sad picture because of the fighting, because of the warfare that is going on. And we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings that Jesus said. And last time I was here, we mentioned that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He didn't come to establish anything new. He says, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And you had better let your righteousness exceed that of your teachers, the scribes, the Pharisees, because they are not living righteous lives. They have taken the original standard of God, that bar, and they've dropped it. They've lowered it. And they're teaching you to do it. And you cannot teach people to relax the laws of God. And we're going to pick up in verse 21. And Jesus says, You have heard it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder. Well, this is true. And you can say, well, this is right from the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. What is Jesus saying here? This is true. But Jesus is about to expose what the leaders are teaching and how they've taken that bar and they've lowered it down. Now, we can take a look here and we can take a look at the carnage and all those lives that were slaughtered needlessly and have been in the past hundred years because we are allowing our inner selves to rage and fight against one another. But the killing over here in Flanders has not ended. In all of those mounds, Jackson was also in Passchendaele. It was very muddy, a lot of rain. A lot of shells are hidden just below the surface. 
and not so much now, but for years afterwards, farmers were being killed because they're plowing their fields and these unexploded shells are still there. And there are men, squadrons in Belgium who go around and they are still collecting shells from this war. They're just hidden below the surface. They're still killing people. And Jesus is going to show the people, you have these unexploded shells. Of course, he didn't, they didn't have it back then, so I'm jumping here. But there are things hidden just beneath the surface that are going to explode, and they're going to kill you, and they're going to harm you. And right here, we're going to take a look at the idea of murder, and there's something hidden there. Even off the coast of Nova Scotia, there are 500,000 500, tons of explosives. My uncle, who was in the Navy, James Thoreau, he says that after the war, they were just shoveling ordnance over, pitching it over the sides of the ship. And every once in a while, you have some fisherman and he catches one of these. There's always the concern that there might be a cascading explosion if, if they blow up because the high explosives are deteriorating. The detonators are, are degrading. In fact, you may have heard just a, a month ago in England, they had to evacuate portion of a town because an unexploded bomb was discovered there. So Jesus here is going to show that we have unexploded bombs. I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So Jesus is, is exposing what the leaders are saying. The leaders are saying, you shall not murder, but everything up to that point is fine. It's acceptable. And last week we took a look that Sometimes people want to just get as close to the edge as they can. We should be saying, how far can we allow God into our lives? The will of God into our lives. And yet we're saying, how far can we go away without falling over that edge and being displeasing to God? And so here he's not contrasting the law of Moses. Jesus is not saying, I I'm going to replace the law of Moses. He's replacing what these teachers are saying. And he's saying you should not be angry with a brother or a sister. And we say, well, you just don't understand, Jesus. No, maybe we are the ones who do not understand. The Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, he was a pagan. He was considered the last of the good Roman emperors. But he was the most powerful man in the world. And he wrote down little things at the end of the day, observations. Today, they're called the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. He wrote them only for himself, not for other people. But again, he's the most powerful man in the world. And it's interesting to read what he says, what the most powerful man said and thought. And he said to himself, memo to self, today you will meet an irritating person. And it's true. We, maybe not for us every single day, for him who's meeting people, he's going to meet irritating people. And we know that we are going to meet irritating people. Some of you may have ran into an irritating person driving here, coming here this morning. We're going to meet them. Why are we so upset or shocked whenever we do? It's going to happen. It's just as sure as the sun comes up and down every day. We're going to meet irritating people. But Marcus Aurelius went and said to himself and to us, that person really can't harm us. We are mature enough. We're wise enough. We have an intellect. We can put a barricade or fortifications around us. I guess in our, in our own parlance, we would say, don't let that irritating person get under your skin. Don't get angry. Don't be filled with hate towards that person. Because when you respond to them, that you are harming yourself. You can't change them. You can only change yourself. You get angry with them. You are not getting rid of those bombs that are hidden beneath the surface. And there is going to be an explosion. There is going to be problems. And then Jesus says, if you insult them and if you start calling them different names. Now, this may, the principle here applies to us. Obviously, these people, these teachers, these scribes, and the people in Judea are thinking, we can do anything we want to a person. We can verbally assault them, attack them. So long as we haven't committed murder, we are doing all right. And here in our society, we are just as bad. I'm sure you've heard somebody in the past week, or you'll hear them this week, they'll say, so-and-so made me so mad. Why, I could have just socked them or plowed them, or I'd like to kill that person, or if I could go through the tele telephone at that person. So we hear it all the time. Why are we like that? 
Well, this is just my own supposition. We say that people are being dramatic. Drama comes from the theater. And when you take a look at what's on the theater, the playwright supposedly is exposing for the people to think about. But what do you see? You see this dialogue and they're arguing with one another and carrying on. And then that, get, that got into the movies. And most of us were raised on television. And how do they generate those cheap laughs on situation comedies, sitcoms, by insulting other people? So our society, we are very much like this. We are constantly insulting and putting other people down. And Jesus says, this is wrong. This is not the way that things should be. You are liable for what you are doing. These are those unexploded bombs, and you're just going to create and cause problems. So this, this is Jesus' first correction to the teaching. Hatred is condemned. Just because you didn't strike them doesn't mean that you didn't lash out in hatred against them. It's wrong. Uh, and it's not normal. It's not universal found around the world. Uh, one of the British administrators in 18th century India took the Hindu laws, the, they call them the Gentus at the time, and we have the Code of the Gentus, the Law of the Gentus. And in that, verbal abuse is punishable. It's a punishable crime. And even today, Indian people, they're, they're fairly respectful. You don't hear them verbally abusing people, not like us. And it may or may not be because of the situation comedy. Maybe they're just reflecting our reality. But we should not be like this. And the teachers certainly should not have been like that. And Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, don't be like that. Do not be filled by hatred. Do not let that irritable person make you flare up. Don't lash out with your tongue. And this is challenging. This is very, very challenging to us. And I'm sure it was challenging to them. But again, Jesus is not interested in having followers and having crowds. He wants disciples. And so if people don't want to accept this, this is fine. But you want to follow Jesus, you want to be a disciple, we are going to have to control ourselves so that we don't have these hidden bombs. But if this is not challenging enough, Jesus is going to raise that standard even higher to where it originally was. Take a look at verse 23 to 26. When you are offering your gift at the altar, okay, the teachers are going to be offering their altars all the time. Presumably these people want to please God. When you are offering it and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Do you see what Jesus is subtly doing here? We like to think, oh, they are the people that are wrong. We we're fine. They have offended me. But Jesus is saying, no. You are that irritable person. You are the one who's offended other people. So before you offer your sacrifices to God, you go and you make it right. So the standard is reconciliation. The standard is harmony. God wants us to be living in harmony with one another. No parent wants their children to be fighting and bickering. They want their children to be harmonious. No teacher wants the classroom to be fighting and harmonious. She wants the whole class to be living in a state of harmony. And that's the same with God. He wants us to live in harmony with one another. That is what he is teaching us. So murder is, is wrong, but hatred and verbal abuse is also a bad thing which should be eliminated. We see the distance that the leaders and the teachers have taken it. And there's a huge gap. And Jesus has said, I have come to restore the standard. I have come to fulfill the law. Now, this would have been hard for the listeners. We have it a little bit easier because Jesus is talking about reconciliation, going to the person whom you've offended. And what has God done? While we were enemies of God, he reconciled us. He established the plan for us. 1 John 3, we see that relations matter to God very much. And we've got to stop excusing our anger and our words. John 3, 
Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? This is the standard. And this is the standard that Jesus taught. This is the standard that his apostles would later teach. And this is the standard by which we must live. Relations matter to God. They are very important to God. Romans 12. Like the flip there now. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is the standard. This is the standard by which we must live. And what did Jesus say is part of the blessed life? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Well, if relationships matter to God, and they do, and we see this, what can be more special than the marital relationship? And so now Jesus addresses that. And he says this in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And true, this is in the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Here's another way which the leaders have lowered the standard. Okay, adultery, but everything else up to that goes. Everything can count. And we take a look at the pagan world and it was pretty disgusting back then. We look at their artwork, we look at their stories, we look at their principles, but we have no right to throw stones at them. Look at how we have acted and gone today. Again, in the theater, they always have to have some uh, adulterous situation, and then you get it into the movies, even right back from the 20s and 30s, and then on TV and on radio, you've got these soap operas and TV as well. And now here we are in the 21st century, with the internet and everything that can be seen on the internet. And not to forget that advertisers, their whole mantra was sex sells. And so we have been generated all these lustful thoughts. And Jesus says, these are also those shells that are hidden below the surface. And when they explode, it's going to destroy families, lives, destroy careers. So Jesus is warning against this as well. And these teachers are willing to let that standard slip. They've dropped the bar. And they're proud of themselves. We haven't murdered anybody. We haven't committed adultery. But what else are they doing? And they think they're fine. They have relaxed the laws of God. Rip out your eye. This is not a suggestion. This is pretty serious stuff. And I would say today, you know, does that mean that electronic eye in our house that computer screen, what should we do about that? Well, we've got a clicker. There are filters. There are blockers. Use them. Employ them. Avoid that kind of stuff. 
And he talks about cutting off a hand. This is really drastic. Who or why would somebody cut off a limb? Well, it was an unpleasant experience for me when I was a young lad. I saw a muskrat caught in a trap. And it was gnawing to get, it was, it was willing to sacrifice its paw to get out of that trap. Nasty vision. Medically, why are limbs removed? If you have gangrene, the doctor is going to cut that off. They do not want the poison to spread throughout the whole system, throughout the whole body. We have a lot of unexploded shells in our lives, and Jesus is pointing them out. It's not enough to do everything up to murder, to do everything up to adultery. They have to be eliminated. It has to be removed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this, rejects not human authority, but God, who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. We see how far these leaders have fallen. They're supposed to be the teachers. They really let their people down. Jesus is putting the standard back up. Our sanctification, our holiness, are pleasing, being pleasing to God. So we've got to find these bombs, these unexploded shells. We've got to get rid of them. We've got to root them out and get rid of them. Purity of heart will protect us. And of course, that's another part of the blessed life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus was not willing to lower the standard. He was different from those scribes and Pharisees. And we must not lower the standard. We do, temptation creeps into our life, and there's going to be an explosion. It's going to destroy us. There's no such thing, well, there are, but there's no such thing as the scribes and Pharisees seem to teach that we're okay so long as we avoid the big sins. No, anything displeasing to God, anything against what he has taught us is wrong, and we've got to root it out. These are hard words of Jesus but if we want to see God, if we want to be pure and holy and like him, then we must follow and obey the standards that Jesus has laid down for us.